Welcome everybody to the First Tech Challenge uh, Coach Mentor Professional Development. Uh, this session is about programming and we are very fortunate to have Circuit Breakers Team 10435 um, kind of guide us through their programming that they learned about and uh, maybe give us some helpful tips and tricks. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn over to the Circuit Breakers. We are the 10435 Circuit Breakers from Waukee, Iowa. Our team is made up of 13 members ranging from grades 8 through 12. I'm Samanya Devori and I'm in eighth grade. This is my second year of FTC. Now we'll be going over SDK installation. Android Studio installation. Step one. In the, this meeting, oh boy, my mic is cut out again. Can I have like a couple of minutes? We can we can hear you. Yeah, you sound great. I do? Yes. That's odd, because on my end, it's saying I'm not getting anything. Oh, you're perfectly fine. All right. Android Studio installation. In this part of the presentation, I will be showing you how to install Android Studio. These steps are specifically designed for using the Google Chrome browser. Step one, in the search bar, install, type in Android Studio installation. Step two, select the link that states install Android Studio, the official Android IDE. Step three, on the Android Studio homepage, select download options. Step four, on the download options page, Choose which version of Android Studio to download depending on your device's OS. The options are Mac, Windows, Linux, and Chrome OS. After clicking the relevant link, the Android Studio will automatically be downloaded on your computer. Once the download is completed, click on the file name, click on the file name and complete the installation by accepting the terms and conditions and then entering any personal configuration. If necessary, a user guide is also available on completion of the download. And then after a period of time, Android Studio will be installed on your device. So now I'll have a little bit of time for questions after each section of the presentation. So does anybody have questions about uh, Android Studio installation? Uh, none have popped up into the chat yet, but I think it might be a little early. Um, so uh, I would go ahead and, and keep going. In this part of the presentation, I will be going over installing the FTC SDK and opening it on Android Studio. To install the FTC SDK, you first have to go to the FTC GitHub and open your current season's repository. Once you are inside the repository, click the drop down menu next to the green download code button. You now have two options to download the FTC SDK. If you don't have Git, download the zip, unzip it, and put the SDK wherever you'd like. If you do have Git, copy the link in the drop down, then go to the terminal and enter git clone and paste the link to clone the contents of the repository for your own personal use. Next, you'll have to open the SDK project in Android Studio. To open the FTC SDK project in Android Studio, you have to open Android Studio and click open existing project. A menu will appear with all of your files in it. Search for the SDK and once you have found it, click on it and select open. Your project will then be opened and ready to use. So does anybody have questions about either the SDK installation or the Android Studio installation? Because those are like the two essential things of the uh, of the project. And then we're about to get into things that are less essential, but still very nice to have. Feel free to type any questions you have in the chat window and we'll ask them throughout the presentation. But uh, so far, everybody's, everybody's doing good.
So I would go ahead and continue on. Okay, so in FTC, the way Java programming is set up is you have um, a, a very small portion of the overall FTC program is your own, and that is the op mode. So the, the actual apps are managed by the FTC SDK, but the, <coughs> excuse me, the op mode, the part that tells, the op mode is the part that tells the robot how to behave uh, in response to the state of the game pads or the controllers that drivers have. Um, so there's an, there's an op mode class for teleop, uh, the driver control portion of the game, and there's an op mode class for autonomous, the autonomous portion of the game. Um, and they, they both just uh, describe how the robot should behave. They do not work with the uh, rest of the workings of the app. It's an isolated class that just tells the robot how to behave. Um, and in the case of Teleop, you get access to the gamepad state. Before you, you press on, uh, uh, one, one quick question that did pop up while you, while you were beginning is, was can you use any programming IDE um, for, for FTC? Uh, so yes and no. Uh, you can use any editor you'd like. Um, I mean, if, if you want to if you want to write your entire uh, FD, FTC program in the terminal using Nano or Emacs or whatever, you can do that. Um, you can you could edit it with the Atom IDE or Sublime Text or whatever. Mm -hmm. But to actually build and run the Android app, um, it's it's almost essential to use Android Studio unless you're very well versed in. Uh, in the command line and you can do all of the things Android Studio automates for you. Right. Uh, so you, you can use other options, but it'll be a lot easier if you just use Android Studio. Uh, okay, and a, and a follow-up question on that is convince me in a sentence or two that Java, especially Android Studio is better than block programming. Uh, yeah, so so block block programming does work fine if you are uh, if you're not trying to do anything advanced. The advantage of Java is you have a lot more control over your uh, over your program, and you can do a lot of things in Java that you can't do in blocks. Uh, especially if you're trying if you get into you get into things like uh, programming, like parallel tasks, doing things at the same time, or uh, if you want to uh, track versions of your code and collaborate with people, but it's a lot easier to do that with Java than it is with blocks. Okay. I'm sorry for interrupting. I guess you can, can, can go for it some more. Yeah, you're good. Okay, so to declare your first teleop, the program that runs during the driver controlled period, um, you have your class, you can name it whatever you'd like. And we extend iterative op mode because it breaks uh, parts of the program into individual methods better. Um, and then to ensure that it's visible on the driver station, you annotate it with at teleop. And then you, this name variable is whatever you want the driver station to see. So in this case, this op mode will appear on the driver station under the teleop uh, options at, with the name first teleop. Um, it does this using reflection uh, before the program runs. Um, so inside our class definition, we're going to define two motor variables. In this case, we just have a DC, we have two DC motors, left motor and right motor. Um, and we're just going to run a basic push bot. So the only methods that you'll need for this are the init function and the loop function. Um, and these are inherited from iterative op mode. So if we look at the init function, uh, inside it, we're going to assign our motor variables values. So in this case, we get access to a hardware map 
which is defined on the driver, or sorry, it's defined on the robot controller. That's that hardware configuration that you get to set up when you um, are with the rev hubs and, or I suppose the control hub. And we tell it that we're getting a DC motor named left motor. Uh, you need to have told it, you need, you, you need to have a left motor configured before this code will work, otherwise it'll throw an exception uh, and you won't be able to initialize. So before you run this code, you have to tell it, I have a left motor, it's a DC motor on port three. Um, and we're gonna do the same thing with the right motor. And then because the motors are going to be facing different directions, we need to tell the left motor to run in reverse so that both motors uh, will turn the wheels forward. Now we're gonna look at the loop function. Um, here, all we have to do is update the motor powers to whatever our gamepad uh, sticks are. So the gamepad objects are, and, and the hardware map, they're all inherited from iterative op mode. So you don't have to worry about All you have to do is access the values. Um, the y axes of the joysticks are inverted on the game pads. So we're going to put this negative sign in front of them. Um, and in this instance, we're using tank steering. So the right stick will control the right motor and the left stick will control the left motor. Uh, and that's all you need for your first tally out. Um, okay. That'll be a basic push block. Question uh, Is your left motor object and your parameter left motor the same? which has to match the robot configuration. I'll see you're back here. Yep. What, sorry, what, what are you asking? Um, the, the, the text uh, left motor yes. um, and your, and your uh, object uh, called left motor. Yes. Um, are those the same? And they does are. it have to, and does it have to match what the robot configuration says? It does not. So you can, you can name these objects, whatever you like. Um, and you can name your configuration whatever you'd like. So, yeah, so the want. things, the What's things that? in the quote is the name in the configuration file. Yes, the quotes in the configuration. So you could put as long as you if if you if your configuration uh, labeled the motor Jeffrey, you would just change this to Jeffrey, and it would work just fine. Um, these two names don't know about each other, uh, and they don't care about each other. It helps the programmer though. <laughs> it does, yes. Um, I would highly recommend using names, variable names or, or configuration names that describe what the variable is doing. Uh, otherwise, the second somebody else looks at your code, they're gonna be like, what is all of this? Uh, moving forward, we're gonna look at the autonomous op mode. Uh, this is run very similar to the tell the app, it's just you don't have access to the gamepad object. Um, so we're still gonna have our annotation that tells the driver station uh, how to, uh, how to, sorry, describe this class. So in this case, this drive forward op mode will show up with the autonomous op modes named first autonomous on the driver station. Uh, and this time we're extending from linear op mode because there's not as much to do in autonomous. Uh, and we'll get to that in a minute. We're still gonna have our left and right motors. Uh, if we want to de declare anything else, we can do that here. And then inside our run op mode method, uh, we'll just tell the autonomous how to work. Now run op mode is called as soon as initialize is pressed on the driver station. So we're going to have to uh, make a call to wait for start over here after we have uh, initialized everything. Otherwise the op mode will start running before you hit start. Uh, and you don't want that to happen. So oh, we're going to assign our left and right motor variables as we did before in teleop. Uh, and we're going to set the left motor in reverse again. We're going to wait for start. And then this op mode just drives forward for two seconds and stops. So in this, it used to be that we updated the left and right motor powers inside the loop method. Uh, now we're just going to do it once. This will set them to 25% power. 
Uh, and then the sleep function tells it to wait for 2000 milliseconds. Um, that's the unit attached to this. And then the left and right motors will set that power to zero and that'll conclude the op mode. Uh, so that's a, that's a pretty basic autonomous, but we just wanted to show you the concept. Bear in mind with the sleep function that under the hood, um, it's just a call to thread.sleep. So your timing will probably not be exact. Um, they'll be close, but the operating system and the JVM do not guarantee that the thread will be woken up and continued after it's done sleeping. Uh, I mean, it'll, it'll continue at some point, but not necessarily immediately after. So your 2000 milliseconds will not be the exact time that it waits. Uh, so if you are looking to do, uh, if you're looking to do autonomous programming uh, with precise movements, I would avoid basing them on, uh, too closely on time. You'll get close, but it will not be exact. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about that uh, um, that sleep call. Um, so the you're saying that it's not guaranteed to be two seconds. Is there anything that you can do to uh, to make it more closely resemble, like setting up sem semaphores or something very advanced like that? That you know. Uh, so the the only way I know of that would so so when you when you call thread.sleep, you are telling the JVM uh, that it can stop execution on your thread for at least the time that you give the JVM. In this case, it's two thousand milliseconds. And then the the JVM will do work on other threads um, because it has a limited number of uh, it has a finite amount of resources and it will probably be, I, I know that the FTC SDK is running multiple threads at a time. Oh, gotcha. um, so you, you so can't suspend thread. all threads. What's that? You couldn't suspend all threads while it's sleeping. No, okay. it, it's not, to, not to my knowledge, uh, because you have, there are other threads on the, on the FTC SDK that are like running telemetry and, uh, I, I'm not sure. I know there's a UI thread. Um, right. I, I haven't dug deep enough into the SDK to find all of the threads, but I know there's multiple and I know that the JVM will be executing other threads while this is sleeping. So it's, uh, it's wake up time is never guaranteed. If you wanted a guaranteed wake up time, the closest uh, thing to that that I know of right now would just be a while loop that blocks and waits for 2000 milliseconds to have elapsed. Mm -hmm. um, you wouldn't use milliseconds. The, I, I'm fairly certain the most accurate timing call is a system.nano time. Um, or it, it's, it's something like that. I know it's in nanoseconds. Um, okay. but that's, that's the one where the JVM actually goes to the operating system and asks it for the uh, time in nanoseconds. So if you're if you're trying to get super exact wait times, uh, your best bet is to block on your thread. Um, and I would the only way I know how to do that is through a while loop um, that's just waiting on time. Understood. I, sorry for to everybody for going so deep, <laughs> peeling back the onion. Um, one question did pop up: Why immediately set the power to zero? after setting it to 0.25? I mean, uh, so, so it's not immediate. The, the right. sleep call will suspend execution. So, so this method will stop running at the sleep call. And then two seconds later, it'll be restarted after it. Um, so you're basically driving for two seconds. Yeah. Your, so. your, wheels are, your, your wheels are moving for two seconds. Yep. Very good. Okay. All righty. All right. So those were those were the uh, the motor movements, the very basics of op modes. 
if you want more information or examples, for example, how to use TensorFlow, uh, OpenCV, um, the, the sensors, there are a ton of examples um, in the FTC SDK repository under external samples in the FTC robot controller module. So there's a bunch of them. There are op modes that you can run on your robot. Um, so you can see how it works, modify them, copy and paste. Like they're very good for uh, learning how sensors and things like that work. Uh, obviously, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have time to go through all of the sensors. There's probably 20 examples, maybe. Um, okay. But there, there are more things that you can do with this than just control motors. Right. Um, Rip, one, one other quick question is, is why we want the wheels to move for two seconds? And 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 it was answered in the in the chat also. It's, it's this is just an example. Let you know. Let's say you wanted to drive your robot for two seconds. Here's how you would do it. Yeah, it's it's an example. I mean, in a in a real scenario, you might drive forward for two seconds and then turn and do something. It's right. this, is, this is just to show the basics of a program. Yeah. Uh, for for example, for the ultimate goal, if you were uh, if your motors were if you were moving faster. And all you wanted to do was park over the white line. You could this this code would do that for you in autonomous, and you'd get the points for parking over the line. All right. So now we're, we're as as we're moving through the presentation, we're getting to things that are less essential but still really nice to have. So now we're going to talk about Git. Um, Git is a version control system, and it lets you keep track of different versions of your programming projects. Um, depending upon how advanced you get with it, you can also ensure that your uh, each version of your project is backed up to the cloud, and it makes it very easy to collaborate with other people. Uh, but we're not going to talk about that portion, because then we're diving into a pretty extensive Git tutorial. We're just going to look at version control with Git. Uh, because it's a really helpful way to save you from yourself. Um, one of the one of the hard things about programming FTC is there's a lot of there there may be a lot of things that happen on the fly, especially at competitions. And if you break something, Git is the ultimate undo button. Uh, it's the ultimate command Z. So it'll keep track of different versions of your projects. And if you break something, you can just revert to the last working version. So my screen is shared. I'll actually, sh I'll show you guys how this works right now. Um, it is a command line tool, so you do have to install it. Depending upon if your if your system's Mac, then you can use Homebrew and install Git that way. If you're on Windows, I'd recommend installing Git Bash. Uh, I'm running it that way, but it's a it's a very simple command line tool that will help you uh, keep track of different versions of your project. So here I've pulled up the command line. Um, everybody can see this on the screen, right? Yes, we can see it. Okay. So let's say that I have our programming project. I'm just gonna call it example right now. So I'm in my project and I'm gonna make an example um, code file. So we'll just call this code.txt, but we have version one of our code. And let's say that we uh, we got version one working. So we have our working version. Uh, in order to let Git know about this version, we first have to initialize Git in our example uh, project. All we do is say Git init. Then we need to tell Git um, which files we want it to pay attention to. So we say Git add, and then whichever files. Um, in this case we want Git to pay attention to our entire project. And the way you reference your, which, and our project is the current folder, we're inside example right now. So to reference the current folder, all I have to do is type a dot, and now Git will track everything inside this example folder. So Git is, after I run this command, Git will be tracking code.txt. Uh, now, if we look at our code.txt, we're still in version one. Um, so we're going to tell Git about it. We're going to say this is version one. So each uh, each version of your code is called a commit for Git, um, and then that dash n just tells Git what the message is or the label for the commit. So we will 
have our first commit. And now we have one version of the project. Let's say it's competition time. Uh, we're running around, we're trying to fix things on the fly and we wind up breaking things. So now our, our version one becomes version two, but version two is broken. So how do we fix it? Um, well, we're gonna get add, we're going to label it version two. And now we have, we've established version one, we've established version two. If we do get log, we can see the list of commits in order uh, from most recent at the top to older at the bottom. So we can see that our current commit with the head is version two, uh, but we had an older version of the project that was version one. And let's say version two is broken, we wanna go back to version one. All we do is copy this commit ID and say git checkout, and then that commit ID. And now if we look at our code, it's back to version one. Uh, so this will this will save you. Uh, I, this is a very minuscule example. You do this in an Android Studio project, but the commands are the same, uh, uh, and the behavior it will put back deleted files. It will uh, add back new files, uh, or get rid of new files. It will uh, if if you have different branches or you're working on different features simultaneously, Git will manage that for you. Um, it's a very good way to collaborate and keep your code safe uh, because if anything happens to it and you can't just command Z your way out of it, Git will save you. Uh, okay. So please, please, please learn to use Git. Uh, I wish in some of my earlier years that I had used Git because I knew about Git and I used it to download the uh, FTC, FTC SDK and things like that, but I never, I never used it for uh versions in this way and i shot myself in the foot um in that sense so please <laughs> learn and use git we do have a question on yeah. git yep uh does this type of version control operate without you having to create a git account for your team code yeah so so git is just a command line tool uh i think you're thinking of github so if you want to use cloud backups and like remote collaboration, uh, that's where you need GitHub. Uh, and you would, you would have one account for each individual user. Um, so you'd, you'd make a repository on your GitHub and share it with whoever you wanted to collaborate with. And then everybody would download the project that way. But just to use Git, you don't need accounts. Yeah, okay, what is the advantage over creating an account and tracking version control through Git desktop and Git team account for your code. So that's the that's that's the difference. Is uh, the command line is basically creating a GitHub just on your personal computer, correct? Uh, yeah, kind of, yeah. And so you, you you've got all your version control for your specific files on your specific computer. You're not sharing that with the world, whereas the team account is like you said, it's on the internet, it's on the server there, um, and it can be shared among other different people. It, it would be a good idea to use GitHub. I wouldn't do it with a team account. I would make individual accounts because um, they don't they won't cost you anything. And right. with a team account, you don't have the option for collaboration because the entire team's on one account. But with individual accounts, you could collaborate. Um, to do you have any recommendations uh, for resources for learning to use Kit Git with Android Studio? Uh, so I, I wouldn't worry about Git with Android Studio. It behaves the same everywhere if you're using the command line. Um, like, like you can use it in an Android Studio project. You can use it in a Visual Studio project. You, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, you can use it on your English essay if you want to. It, it'll be <laughs> the same thing. Um, and there, there are a ton of resources online. If you just look up like getting started with Git, um, you'll learn a lot. There's only maybe five commands that you really need to know. Um, so it's it's not too. It's it's it looks daunting because it's on the command line, but it's it's pretty straightforward. It's pretty simple. Right. Um, but there, there's a bunch of guides online. So if you just look up getting started with Git or how to use Git. Um, 
you'll find plenty of good beginner guides. Um, Get um, one one coach says that GitHub Classroom works well for FTC. Okay, I have not tried that, uh, but that's cool. Oh. All right. Um, now we're going to get into programming design patterns. So these are not essential, but they will result in you having less code, uh, and less code usually leads to less bugs. Less bugs mean your code's more reliable. Um, and depending upon the design pattern, it may improve uh, the performance of your uh, teleop or autonomous code. So let's get into them. Uh, I'm going to be showing you a way to simplify your telemetry. Uh, I'm going to show you how to do event driven programming in teleop. Uh, and I'm going to show you how to do dependency injection for your hardware variables um, or anything you're getting. For your hardware map from your hardware map um, so that you have to so that you don't have as much code to write uh, and your the code that you do write performs better so let's look at telemetry simplification so if you programmed in know that with telemetry you have to make calls to telemetry.add data for anything that you want to appear in telemetry and then you have to update it and clear it um, and uh, without having looked at the implementation, it does look like you are clearing out a big map of objects after every teleop loop and then creating a new one at the beginning of every teleop loop and adding it to telemetry. And that's pretty costly. Um, and it's also painful if you are uh, dealing with nested data. So let's say you have a robot object and you don't have access to the variables inside it because they're private, well, how do you add them to telemetry? Because are you, are you going to pass telemetry to the robot object? Uh, it's, it becomes messy if you want to coordinate, uh, if you want to get a lot of telemetry variables from a lot of places out. So what you can do is just use annotations uh, and reflection at runtime to find everything um, that has those annotations and then populate telemetry that way. Uh, and it will also optimize your, uh, if, if you optimize your reflection pattern, it'll uh, be much, uh, but, but much more, it'll perform much better than if you were to clear out telemetry every time and update it because this won't do that. Uh, so to set up an annotation, uh, much like the at telemetry and at autonomous annotations, um, you just declare it. In this case, we tell it that we want it to be there at runtime and that we can annotate fields or methods with this annotation. So we're going to make an annotation. We're going to call it observable and it has one property, this key. So to use it, all we have to do is annotate fields we want to uh, put in telemetry with add observable. And then the key just tells it what to label it in telemetry. So in this, uh, in this example, we have annotated methods, um, left trigger and right trigger with the add observable annotation, LT and RT. And our reflection program has found everything that's add observable, gotten the value and put it in telemetry. So over here, let's say that our uh, left trigger was press, which actually I suppose that should be a, a, a decimal between zero and one but um, it'll put the left trigger value over here and the right trigger value over here. Um, the reflection code is up to you. I did not include that in the presentation because it's kind of, can be kind of long, probably about a hundred lines. Um, but I did save my, doing this, I saved myself 88 lines of telemetry code um, just by adding the add observable and then anything that I want in telemetry, all I have to do is put in add observable. Anything that I don't want in telemetry, I just delete add observable. Um, these annotations would also work just on the raw gamepad.left trigger, but we don't have access to that, um, which is why they're wrapped in methods. So um, the result of our annotation-based telemetry is we don't have, and we don't have to deal with telemetry from our op mode. Uh, all we do is 
mark things as observable and our the rest of our program will take care of dealing with telemetry. Um, can, yeah. Yeah, can yeah, you show to, yeah can you show that in an example of a like a like your um demo example for your uh teleop or or uh, autonomous code that you had earlier have, where you would make those ad observable calls uh so the so the ad observable things are just annotations on top of any property that you want um in telemetry so like you could so so let's say let's say in our autonomous declaration um well here i can just edit this yeah please okay so let's i'm gonna we're gonna pretend that the motor variables are there but just to save space on the slide i'm gonna get rid of them um let's say you had an uh int why won't it let me edit this out i'm not there we go Let's say you had an int, or we're gonna call it left motor power. And um, okay, so let's say let's say you had left motor power, and in your loop you were just updating your left motor to whatever that left motor power is um obviously somewhere in this loop you'd probably also be uh, maybe calculating what the left power should be so it updates and you're not just setting the same thing every time um right. but let's say you had that variable the idea is that instead of having calls to clear telemetry telemetry add data and telemetry update all you have to do is mark it as uh add observable uh p equals and it would show up in your telemetry for you. That's the idea. And where does it equate the key to the value of left motor power? Uh, that is where you get into the more complex reflection code. So okay. I have that code on my GitHub repository. Um, I didn't include it in the presentation because it's long. So I would recommend knowing you, you have to know java and no reflection to do this um so uh, observable and reflection are part of the standard java the jdk yeah so so reflect reflection is a reflection is a concept where you uh, the code is looking back on itself um that's why it's called reflection so you can so from inside the code you can look at classes and find uh, find their instances. You can find the fields inside of them, and you can search for things that are marked as ad observable. Um, so the JVM supports reflection, uh, which means that your code can like look back on itself um, and see, okay, this class has these fields and these methods, um, and. And then you using reflection um, lets you get access to everything inside a class um, without very, knowing very much about the class, which is why this works well for telemetry because you can just put it in anything. Okay, and uh, I guess we, we you need to get back to to the presentation, and I apologize to everybody for for taking control, but this this uh, this old dog is learning new tricks right now. <laughs> So um, I, uh, I appreciate that. Just one more question on that. Have you let the um, FTC developers know about using that instead of telemetry maybe? Uh, I haven't, um, but I could, I could submit a pull request with the reflection-based options. Um, that'd be, that'd be kind of cool. All right, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll get on that. We, we've been using them for, a few years now so i'll just uh put that in with our i'll take our stuff and submit a pr they they would they would appreciate that thank you yeah no problem okay um
All right. So next we're going to look at um, event driven architecture. So the idea is uh, well, so the, the idea is twofold. One, it's to make your code more flexible, but two, uh, it's to reduce the amount of hardware calls that you're making. So um, during, during teleop especially, you want to minimize the number of hardware calls you're making to the rev hub because those are uh, expensive in terms of resources. So the hardware calls are any calls where you're setting motor powers, you're getting sensor values, anything like that. Um, Rev did introduce a batch read so you can get values out of your sensors and motors efficiently, but they did not introduce a batch write. So every time you're calling set power or set position or whatever, um, it is sending at least as far as I can tell, it is sending data to the Rev Hub and telling it to do something. Um, and that takes time and it's a costly operation and it'll slow down your teleop loop. Um, the issue with slowing down your teleop loop is it doesn't run as frequently because it, can only, it only runs one loop at a time. So if you... So it will, 20 times a second, that's not bad. Um, your program is going to be pretty smooth. But if you are making a ton of hardware calls, your loop will take longer to run. Maybe it only runs 10 times a second. And now you have issues where your drivers are doing things on the joysticks and they're not seeing uh, quick responses from the robot. Or depending upon what they're doing, they might not see a response at all. And that's not good. So in order to ensure that your teleop loop isn't consuming too many resources, um, you can use event-driven architecture. So here I have some example code from last year um, that does not use event-driven architecture. So we have this example, a uh, wobble arm object um, and a wobble target, um, which just tells the wobble object or the arm what position to be in. So in this case, we're trying to see if the A button is pressed and if the A button is pressed, we're going to set the wobble target to pick up and every iteration of the loop set in the wobble target to whatever this wobble target variable is. I'm sorry, the, the, the wobble arm position to whatever this wobble target variable is. So, and, and we might not need to set it every iteration of the loop. Um, so let's look at what happens if we use event-driven architecture. Um, we can put a wrapper class around the gamepad. Uh, and I call mine controller but all it does is wrap the gamepad values and keep track of their previous state and their current state. Um, and in this way, you can actually debounce the, uh, the toggles. That was the reason we did that. Um, so all you do is in your initialize, you set up a controller and then you tell it what to do when this A button is pressed. Um, so you give it a function to execute. In this case, we're just going to set the target to, we're going to set the wobble arm position to the pickup position. Um, I told it to debounce this, which means this code will run every time the driver releases the A button. Um, if you don't debounce, what might happen is the driver might press A, and then if they haven't released A by the next loop iteration, the toggle will flip again, and it will only uh, be telling the wobble to be the wobble arm to be at the pickup position for one loop iteration, and that's not going to do anything. Um, so, in order to avoid having to press the button for an even or sorry for an odd number of loop iterations, what you can do is just wait for it to be released, um, and now you know that the uh, now you know that you're not getting an incorrect toggle. It does take two loop iterations instead of one to generate a response, but as long as your loop iterations are fast, you, your driver won't know the difference. Um, and then we told it to pay attention to control surface, the A button. Um, this is example code. You can implement it however you like, but our implementation had a controller wrapper class, which you will need, and some way to tell it what to happen when a control surface is pressed. Um, now, the advantage of this is you will have fewer hardware calls because you're only making calls to the wobble set position when the, uh, when the, 
when the A button is released instead of every loop iteration. Um, your, button will, your buttons can toggle reliably and your code's a little bit more flexible because the only thing that we have to mess with is this line right here, our wobble set target function. Um, and if we want to turn that into a multi-line function, so just a lambda, um, we can do that. But it's a little bit simpler to modify because back here we had uh, four lines and some logic in the loop. And up here, we don't have to worry about logic. We just say what happens when A is pressed. And that's all right here. Um, and then in your loop function, you just tell the controller to update to whatever the game pad is. Uh, but that's a venture in architecture. Does anybody have any questions about that? I haven't seen any. Um, so, all right, I, we are we are definitely peeling very very deep into the onion here. Into the what? Into the onion. Yes. As far um, as the code goes, this is this is very very advanced stuff. Yeah, it uh, it will it will make your programs better. Um, yeah. But it's but it's certainly not necessary. That's that's why it's back here instead of at the front of the presentation. Right. Right. Okay, we've got um, a couple more minutes if you want to go through these quickly. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is the last one. So. Um, before, if we look at initializing motor variables, um, it can be exhaustive because uh, we declare a motor variable and then initialize. We go in the hardware map and we get it, and we set its direction and its zero power behavior and its mode, and we've taken five lines to initialize a uh, motor variable. Um, the other thing is your. Uh, all of your calls have to be right. So that's five lines of code that need to be correct. Um, and we could do it with less code. The other thing is we're using this hardware map, which if you have your robot broken down into different objects, um, that means that your hardware map, the location of your hardware map names in your code is probably in a bunch of different places. Uh, and that's less than optimal. So what we can do is we can make another annotation. In this case, I called it hardware um, and I gave it properties like direction, zero power behavior, and run mode, and I have them default to the common options. Um, we're having we're having this annotation be preserved at runtime, and we're going to make it only available to fields because we want to assign uh, values to variables. We're not trying to mess with methods or classes here. Um, so now, all of our uh, variable declarations. Uh, can be as simple as at hardware name equals motor, and that's it. In this case, I overrode um, my default values, but um, it's it's a little bit shorter. This is one line. I had to uh, wrap it because of the uh, slides, but this does this is all one line. It's a little bit shorter. Um, it'll supply the values for you, and you can centralize your hardware map calls in one place. Um, so now we have our motor and then on initialization, you just tell your dependency injection system to find all of your annotated fields um, and inject them with whatever properties you put in the hardware annotation. Um, again, you will have to, this is a custom roll your own reflection um, system, but uh, rolling your own reflection isn't too difficult. Again, I didn't show it here because it's a lot of code or at least a lot of code to put on a slide. Um, but if you're familiar with reflection, uh, this is pretty simple. And if you're not familiar with reflection, you'll pick it up in no time. Uh, so this is a little cleaner. And the only thing we actually need is the at hardware with the name on it. Uh, but you have less code. Your code's more flexible because all of your initialization is right here. Um, and you can centralize your hardware map to your reflection uh, area and not worry about passing around a bunch of places. Um, so yeah, that's dependency injection. Does anybody have any questions about that? Um, <clears throat> nothing uh, Nothing uh, going on in the chat room, although uh, Becca did post the location of where the recordings for these presentations are gonna be placed, including copies of any slides. Um, so uh, that's, in, that's in the chat, I highly recommend pulling that up uh, by the end of the week. 
and then you'll be able to uh, see, watch us again and uh, see the uh, um, presentation, the, the, power, the PDF of the PowerPoint uh, that the circuit breakers just shared with us. Um, any questions out in the audience, feel free to type them in the chat or if you wanna unmute uh, and ask away. Actually, you know what, in the interest of time, I think we're gonna go ahead and maybe start our 10 minute break between sessions. Okay. Um, Circuit Breakers, thank you all so very much uh, for your expertise and your willingness to share as well. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording.